vision and a passion to transform and strengthen how nursing is taught so our students develop the clinical judgment needed, not only for passing the NCLEX licensure, but more importantly, real world clinical practice and a career at the bedside. And it's great to be with you. And I'd just like to know for those that are watching tonight, where you're from, who you are, go ahead and put your name and your location in the chat and uh, let the world know that you're out there. You know, when we look at the paradigm shifts needed in nursing education, one book that rocked my world about 10 years ago was Dr. Pat Benner and the Carnegie Foundation's research in educating nurses, a call for radical transformation. And this is still a must read book that is relevant to every educator. But in essence, the, the shifts that they advocated that really lay the foundation for some of the things we'd we'll be talking about tonight is the importance to strengthen and transform how we teach nursing and nursing education. We need to contextualize our content to the bedside of patient care. We need to integrate classroom and clinical learning, and we also need to emphasize other ways of thinking besides critical thinking and even nursing process, but emphasize clinical reasoning. And so all of these paradigm shifts have a common thread, which is preparing students for practice, bringing nursing education back to the bedside of patient care and making that our emphasis. And so I'm excited to have tonight's guest, uh, Donna Ignatovicius, or Iggy, as she's known by most. And I'm excited to have her with us tonight. And uh, Donna, I'm just gonna bring you in. You're the, um, you're the founder of the Bootcamp for Nurse Educators, a nationally and internationally recognized expert in nursing education, including expertise in NCLEX and NGN style test writing and curriculum development. She has a company, DI Associates, that she provides faculty development workshops and consultations. And in 2020, she has the 10th edition of Med Surge Nursing, Concepts for Interprofessional Collaborative Care. Now, this is the eighth edition, Donna, so I don't have the 10th yet, but it's one of my favorite Med Surge textbooks and appreciate. Uh, you've been doing this for 10 edition. That means about 30 years, if I can do the basic math. But she's also published a workbook that I've also purchased, and it's titled Developing Clinical Judgment for Professional Nursing Practice and Next-Gen Success to help your students develop clinical judgment to be successful on the NCLEX. And I'm excited to have Donna with us tonight. And so Donna, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us tonight. You're welcome. And you know, I would just love, you know, I, I ask a lot of my guests who come on tonight, you know, in, in any context, you know, what's your story about what brought you into nursing? You know, what was it that interested you in nursing? And then for you, Donna, you pursued nursing education and then made that a next step at some point. And I mean, I don't even think I recall your trajectory. So if you could just briefly share and kind of put the put that spin as far as kind of what got you started and where you are today. What got me started in nursing was one of my favorite high school teachers who happened to be the advisor for our future nurses of America club. I don't even know if they have those anymore. And she convinced me that I should join because I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with her, the organization, and then the experiences we had. We took tours in the hospitals and we just really got to see what it was all about. And it was very exciting. So that's how I really went into nursing school. The other reason I did is because I got a scholarship and we were too poor for me to go to college. So I went to our local diploma school, completely paid for by a scholarship. So that's really how I got into nursing. And then what about the nursing education trajectory, Donna? Because that's relatively unique and you've become very prominent and very well known for your body of work over, I think, at least 30 years unless uh, it's longer than that. I don't want to date you, but I'll let you date yourself. So you tell me kind of just that trajectory with the nursing education piece and really where that kind of started and where you are today, kind of just to lead us on that journey. I really thought I wanted to be a staff nurse my whole life. And in school, I wanted to be a peds nurse until I cared for a sick child who's two years old and had burns and cried the whole time I took care of her. So I decided peds was not for me. So I really thought I wanted to be a staff nurse. I was a charge nurse. I just loved all of that. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized that I loved patient education, just love patient education. I had some personal um, uh, breakup, if you will, with my first husband. And so I ended up moving to Baltimore, looked for the first job I could find that paid well. And it was a staff development job in a long-term care setting. Okay. So that's when I began working with uh, staff nurses working with the aides trying to teach them and I'm like you know I really like this I like patient ed too but I love this mm -hmm. then I got hired by the University of Maryland and their staff development and then got recruited to teach in an, an academic setting so that is really my journey and I just loved everything I did I taught at the BSN level the LPN level the diploma level the associate degree level and then uh, guest lectured even at the graduate level. So I sort of had experience in all of that. Okay. What about the textbook? You know, your textbook is, is used across the country. It's like, how does an educator, you know, with that background, where did that door open to, to basically write the first edition? Um, or what did that look like? I was the coordinator for fundamentals. They didn't call it that, but it was a fundamentals course at the University of Maryland in their BSN program. And back in the day, they used to let the sales reps actually come to the school, talk to us in our offices. And um, I guess he had done some pre-planning work and some asking around about me being a coordinator. And he sat down, one of the sales reps sat down and said, and from Saunders, was Saunders, which is now part of Elsevier, and um, he sat down with me and he said, so what kind of books do you think we need in nursing? Because, you know, we're trying to build our nursing book title list. We're really good at medical, but not so good at nursing. So I just started talking to him. And I have to tell you, I never suggested a med surge book. You just need to know that was not on my list. I thought we had plenty. There's plenty of them. Yes. Right, right. But really then there weren't very many. There really weren't really many that back then. Um, so he said, you know, these are really good suggestions and I'll be in touch with you later. The next day, a book editor from Saunders called me and said, we understand you want to write a book. And I said, oh, no, 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 I, I didn't say I wanted to write a book. I just gave some ideas. So he said, do you want to go to lunch? And I'm like, well, okay, free lunch, right? So out to lunch, we went on campus. And then he started talking to me about writing this book that you know an orthopedic book or a neuro book which are my loves and i'm like no 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 i don't i don't want to write a book but he just didn't want to pay any attention and then his name by the way was mike and mike said you know donna honestly we really need a med surge book that's who i'm looking for authors who can work on a med surge book and i'm like no 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 you know i i've done a few articles i've done some chapters i've never done a textbook well he kept trying to convince me for the next nine or 10 months. And I finally gave in and signed the contract. So that is how it all started. And I should also tell you that a co-author, one of my new co-authors is on this meeting. I just happened to see Sherry from Dayton, Sherry Rebar. I'm assuming that's the Sherry from Dayton. Um, and she is a co-author now, uh, really for the last couple of editions. So, She'll be one of the people taking over the reins when I decide to retire. Awesome. And, you know, when we look at the topic, Donna, which is really one of the, the key topics of really, you know, clinical judgment and developing that key cognitive skill in our students, I think it's important that we define our terms clinical reasoning and clinical judgment. And from your perspective, you know, this is really important for educators to understand the nuanced differences so we can teach it effectively in our programs because they're not the same. And I just like to get your perspective as you put this together and as an expert on the topic, just how would you basically simply and concisely explain the similarities and the differences of clinical reasoning and clinical judgment for our audience? Most of the literature, most of the literature really has a distinction between clinical reasoning and clinical judgment, but the NCSBN definition really puts it all together. So clinical reasoning to me is the process of thinking, of trying to figure out what's going on with your patient, trying to figure out uh, what you're going to do, trying to figure out the outcome. So it's the thinking part. Uh, some people refer to that as critical thinking, but Dr. Benner, in the book you showed earlier, 
uh, said that critical thinking is just one kind of thinking that we need for clinical reasoning. There's creative thinking, there's analytic thinking, there's scientific thinking. So we need all of those types of thinking in, as we use clinical reasoning. And we do so, so we can make a decision and the decision is the judgment, the clinical judgment. Now, again, NCSBN and the way I kind of couch it is they look at the entire process together in one definition, identifying thinking skills, what they call cognitive skills that lead to the clinical judgments to maintain safety and ensure quality care for our patients. Right. And you know, what's interesting is both, you know, as the NCSBN model, Donna, and even Chris Tanner's model of clinical judgment, both basically refer to in their definition that clinical judgment is an outcome, Yes. you know, in a sense that it's kind of like how I see it is like the decision. It's like the end goal. It's the, it's, it's kind of like you have to reason in these steps to get to the end destination, which is judgment. But if you're going to be a purist, you really can't teach clinical judgment. You can teach the reasoning skills and the thinking skills that are needed to get to the destination. And that's really where Tanner's model of clinical judgment really comes into play. And as you, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, Donna, is that, you know, a lot of educators really are not, um, you know, Tanner's framework of clinical judgment needs to be really widely known and recognized in nursing education. Those four reasoning steps of in noticing. What are you noticing? What's your interpretation of what you're noticing? What is your response to that? And then what will be then the reflection or evaluative thinking in that really aligns closely with the NCSBN model. But when you look at Tanner's framework and nursing process, or even the NCSBN model and nursing process, how do those frameworks intersect so that educators are clear that nursing process isn't going the way um, of the eight track? You know, like we're just kind of moving on to something different. Nursing process is still a part of the process, but how do you see nursing process and aligning with the NCSBN model and Tanner's framework of clinical judgment? When the nursing process first came out, it was over 50 years ago. And it was started by, it was really developed by two nurse faculty at Catholic University in 1967. They had the very first publication. You have to keep in mind that in 1967, life was a lot simpler in healthcare. People who were any degree of sick were in ICU, right? But they wanted a way to identify the problem solving approach that nurses use, right? And then they came up with that terminology. It's just a scientific process. Yeah. It's, the, it's the problem solving approach. And it has served us well for, a, I think, a very long time. It seems to me, and you may not agree with me, Keith, but I do think and that nursing process has morphed a bit into a more linear process and more rigid and structured so that there has to be a list of NANDA nursing diagnosis uh, to call that ad hoc, and you can't deviate from that. And it's become very linear in terms of a stepwise approach. The real world is that people have multiple problems. They don't just have one problem like pain, right? Or they're gonna have their gallbladder out. They have multiple problems. And as you have said in previous sessions, I've heard you speak about people come messy, right? There's lots of things going on in their lives and they present with all of these problems. So the nursing process is great for basic problems, linear, stepwise. And the research from a number of places has shown, including Tanner, that that's how nurses use the nursing process or how students use it. Nurses don't really use the nursing process. They go beyond that. So that I see as a foundation. Yeah. I see the nursing yeah. process yeah. as the foundation. And yeah. then we build on that for clinical reasoning to make clinical judgments. And I think that's really the key. Yeah. And that, you know, to me, you know, I, I have a little video webinar titled, How Do You Spell Clinical Judgment? T-A-N-N-E-R using the old Rolaids commercials for those that are old enough to remember. Um, but basically just, you know, really Tanner's framework, Donna, really lays the foundation from my perspective of the reasoning skills that we need to develop and teach our students to really practice those 
reasoning steps of Tanner's framework and you know utilizing, for example, like you know we were talking the other day about how the first step of Tanner's model utilizes uh, is noticing that that you know what does the nurse notice in the context of that environment doesn't necessarily align with the very first step of assessment. You know, it's not like Tanner and nursing process are just kind of linear that just intersect. They are, they're different models of thinking and have that distinction. And I, and I guess I would just like to get your feedback on your insights and how you look at Tanner's framework, which really is a reasoning framework, those steps of noticing, interpreting, the response by the nurse and the reflecting in evaluation. Just uh, what are your thoughts, Donna, with Tanner and how you kind of see that framework and its alignment with the NCSBN? I believe that Tanner is a great model. I was a Tanner fan and still am. Yep, uh, in I am fact, too. in the in the last few editions, not the most recent one, but the eighth and ninth, I believe, we actually aligned the steps of the nursing process with Tanner's four phases of clinical reasoning. So in our textbook, in our med search book, it actually has assessment noticing. It has both of those to show. Now Canada is well ahead of us. They adopted Tanner, or at least most of Canada's schools have adopted Tanner a long time ago. And they talk about clinical reasoning to make clinical judgments. We're still hung up on the nursing process. In fact, they did not even talk about nursing process in Canada until they had to take the NCLEX. And there it is, an integrated process on our test plan. So they were having a really hard time with Mary intersecting the nursing process with uh, the steps or the phases of Tanner's model, which you just mentioned. So I've helped some of the schools there do that. So I obviously believe in Tanner. However, I think Tanner was one of several models that was used along with a review of over 200 pieces of literature that really looked at, it obviously wasn't sufficient enough to meet the uh, literature findings. And they felt that we needed to build on Tanner and, and this is NCSBN I'm talking about, to build on Tanner and to build on the nursing process. So that's why they came up with their own model and really it's that layer three those thinking skills those cognitive skills those are those clinical reasoning skills that you talk about and i think they expand and build even on tanner mm -hmm. and kind of add a couple of extra steps for example like the generating hypotheses step which is basically kind of tanner's model you know i mean as far as the responding you can maybe infer that but it is somewhat different at the same time well, it's generate solutions. So it's recognize cues, analyze those cues, right? And yep. then it's prioritizing hypothesis. What's the major problem going on with this patient? Because I often have more than one. Right. Exactly. And then what are some possible solutions? What are some actions I can take? And then narrow it down to what am I going to do now to take that action or actions? And that might be referrals. That might be you know getting physicians' orders or other healthcare providers' orders. Uh, that might be communication, teaching, whatever those things are, performing a skill, and then evaluating outcomes. And that's that reflection that you would talk about with Tanner. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to let the audience know that if you look in the chat, there is a link to Tanner's article. In fact, she was one of the first, I do believe, I don't know if that's true, Donna, of thinking like a nurse. You know, she was the one back in 2006, the title of her article was Thinking Like a Nurse. And I don't know if think like a nurse was commonly used before that or not, um, but in essence, you know, that think like a nurse, that really I think we all want our students to embody, that's actually the title of uh, Chris Tanner's article published in 2006. And you can go to the link in the chat, and I really would encourage every educator who's watching this is that if you're not familiar with Tanner's model and framework of clinical judgment, it's really imperative for you to really to, to, to grab that, read it, and really integrate that and get a sense as far as how you can practically layer this framework into your program. Because every one of Tanner's questions, basically, or every, every one of her steps, the four reasoning steps, can also be made into a reflective question. 
that you can incorporate into case-based scenarios. And that's kind of the essence of what I've developed with the Keith RN unfolding cases that I've written over the last almost 10 years now. But in essence, you can also really have that knowledge to strengthen your understanding of Tanner's model. And so Donna, I would just like to know, what are you doing now to basically empower and serve the needs of educators to really help develop and strengthen clinical judgment uh, in nursing education? I'm primarily doing two things. One is publish, and I, I'm seeing that people are having echoes. I know I hear the echoes too. I'm not sure why they're happening, but anyway, uh, I apologize for that. I'm not covering the technology, but let me just say I'm trying to uh, produce publications, um, articles. I have an article coming um, that's about clinical judgment, how to incorporate clinical judgment and those skills needed to make those judgments into um, faculty's hands so they'll have resources. Also incorporating those skill sets, those cognitive skills in my general med surge book and in the book you show, Developing Clinical Judgment, which isn't an NGN prep book. It's really exercises to help them use the six thinking skills of the NCSBN model. Uh, and then the other thing I'm doing is a lot of webinars, uh, conferences, all virtual now, of course. Yeah. Um, I did one today, as a matter of fact. Um, so it's been a long day. Um, <laughs> trying to educate them. I find faculty are very thirsty for this knowledge. And, and not just the knowledge, but what do I do with it? How do I help my students? Yeah. I talk a lot about not thinking like a nurse, but thinking in action like a nurse. Because I right. think nurses have to do and think at the same time. Yes. And yes. to me, that's more, I think thinking like a nurse has been so overdone. If I see, no offense, one more book or one more article or one more person say thinking like I'm, I'm going to scream <laughs> or nurse think or, you know, it's thinking in action. Yes, that's, that's what right. nurses have to do. And yes. I think if we keep that in mind, that's going to help us. Students don't know how to translate the knowledge they're learning into practice and how to care for patients. And I think this helps them through various case-based scenarios, as well as other active learning that promotes thinking. I don't think it's just limited to cases, but certainly that's a fabulous way for simulation for that to occur. Yeah, and you know, and, and, and I totally agree, Donna, and it's like, you know, what you're, you know, the, the essence, you know, Pat Benner uh, in Educating Nurses, you know, her definition of clinical reasoning, that to me is the most cogent that I've seen in the nursing literature, and I've memorized it because I've said it enough times at presentations, but it's the ability of the nurse to think in action and reason as a situation changes at the bedside. And that's exactly what you're saying. And that's exactly what Benner is saying and has, you know, that captures her definition as well, Donna. And so, you know, one of the things I just like to kind of kind of dovetail a little bit into, Don, is talking about practice and preparing students for practice. And I want to thank you because back in 2017, when we spoke together at uh, Nurse Educator Institute in, in uh, Branson, you brought in a new article that I has, was not aware of, and it's rocked my world ever since. And that's Kavanaugh in Svita in 2017, a crisis in competency that identified that only 23% of graduate nurses really met entry-level expectations of clinical judgment despite passing the NCLEX. And I think that's why we're seeing next gen because we are still struggling uh, with that. But when you look at the gap, Donna, between you know how nursing is taught and practiced, what are some things that we can do differently to really bring practice, including the development of clinical judgment. That's just kind of one sphere. But you know, there are things, for example, that I see that, you know, how we teach nursing assessment and bringing in higher level assessment skills that a nurse will never use at the traditional bedside. Put away your reflex hammers, your otoscopes, and all these things that I still saw done as an educator when I first started my journey several years ago. But I would just like to know, what do you see, Donna, that we could do as educators to really bring this gap that is still way too big between how nursing is taught and practiced and bring it down that we are really bringing practice and clinical judgment back into our profession? 
I think there's several things that we can do. One peeve I have is that when an instructor takes a textbook and uses that to plan a course around. So I don't know what's in my should be in my course, so I'll just adopt this textbook and then I'll just teach it, right? And have the students read the entire thing. And your example of assessment is one, again, of my very, very big pet peeves. Mm -hmm. Because we oftentimes see very little difference between a basic health assessment course, say in the BSN program, and in advanced practice. You'll see the advanced physical assessment, same book, same content. And I am a victim of that. When I went back to my BSN, being a diploma nurse, I had the same course at the same school at two different types of degrees. So that's not necessary. And Dr. Giddens and others have done some research that show that there's only a core number of skills. It is better to learn a core number of skills and learn them well and when to use them and how to interpret the data you get from them than to be exposed to just this voluminous number of skills. And that's true with knowledge. You know, my right. research book was not meant to help you plan a med search course. It was to you plan the med surge course and then find the best fit books. Second pet peeve, if you believe in clinical judgment and you believe in all the things we're talking about in professional practice, and I ask people, so what are you focusing on? Oh, clinical judgment, safety, QSEN, well, what textbook do you use? Has none of that in there. So how can we say we believe and we emphasize certain concepts or certain important constructs when we don't even have the best fit textbooks. And they're out there. They're out there. So I think that does the students a disservice. You're saying one thing and then saying, but you have to read all this other resource. Mm -hmm. I think the third thing is that we still see, sadly, in 2021, a tremendous amount of traditional lecture format with 5,000 PowerPoints. I might have exaggerated that just a bit. But the idea is that if all I'm gonna do as a student is sit and listen to you for three hours and go through all these PowerPoints, and don't get me wrong, the students want the PowerPoints, feed me, feed me. They don't all want that, but some do. But we have to say, you've got the knowledge right there in your textbook or in your articles or whatever your resources are. My job is to help you clarify and prioritize that knowledge help you figure out what to use when and how to use it in these various contexts. That's where I should be spending my time. I do think there's a slow movement toward that, but I think it is just that slow. Yeah. And you know, we need to put some gas on that fire, Donna, because you know what, Pat Benner and the Carnegie Foundation 10 years ago were raising the banner. And even before then you had fire brands like Dorothy Del Bueno uh, in the nursing literature who's been saying, you know, are, you know, the same problem of just that gap, the inability to think critically. And what's interesting is Kevin on Svita had some great recommendations and ironically their recommendations for nursing education were almost identical to what Pat Benner was saying in the Carnegie Foundation uh, back in 2010. But in essence, I would just highlight that Kevin on Svita put a word in, in, in the vernacular that I never saw before that every educator needs to remember, infobesity. That infobesity and too much information, like Donna was saying, is in essence, your students can't know it all. And that too much information and less is more when it comes to deep knowledge. And, you know, and Pat Benner talked about, again, deep knowledge of what's most important. And so, Again, if we can identify and implement those things into our um, classrooms and all that we teach, we'll be making a difference. But, if, I could uh, just add, if I could just add, absolutely. Also, also, somebody brought up something about concept-based curriculum. That is absolutely the purpose of concept-based curriculum yeah. is to help us de-sat the curriculum, yeah. focus on what's most important, create patterns of knowing and thinking. And so that helps you manage the knowledge mm -hmm. and then the competencies relate to clinical judgment and other competencies, of course, that nurses have to have. Right, right. And, you know, one of the things that I kind of developed as a novice educator, Donna, when I read Penner, uh, Educating Nurses was that I said, 
you know, I, I was in winter break in Minnesota, which is four weeks. We got a whole month off in winter break. And I read that book over winter break and realized I got to get rid of my PowerPoints. I got to put them on a diet. And then I wrote case studies that basically kind of replicated what I saw from my lens of current practice at a metropolitan hospital, just the essence of real world scenarios bringing in Tanner's framework and identifying that. And one of the first pieces of advice, Donna, that you gave me as a very new on the scene, uh, when we met at uh, Deanne Block's uh, Nurse Educator Institute about five or six years ago, do you remember some of the things you said about my case studies? I said they're way complex. That this is for a critical care nurse, not for an entry level generalist or even a student in a generalist program so you responded to that actually and i i take feedback i, I i'm humble enough donna to listen to my elders and uh, people that i respect <laughs> in a good way in a good way and you know what for those of you that want to know the skinny reasoning level on my that, that i've written and have since published on my website and on the membership that skinny reasoning, Donna, that's where I took all of it and I just shrunk it down to just a bite-sized case study with several questions. And you know what? It really uh, has been very helpful. So I want to thank you for that feedback because I'm kind of like, you know, give them, you know, I'm a critical care nurse, want to make my students a critical care nurse. Well, no, it's first year generalist. And we sometimes lose sight of that. So I was appreciating that insight back in the day, Donna. But you know, when you look at the case studies that even I've written, um, you know, do you, what are your thoughts and perspectives on kind of as an active learning strategy that we need to develop clinical judgment? I just like to get your, your thoughts and comments. Unfolding cases are my favorite. Yeah. They're absolutely my favorite. And even your skinny cases are, have a pretty high bar, by the way. So okay. Uh, okay. I, I could, I could shrink it down even further. <laughs> no, but I'm not saying that's bad to have a high right. bar as long right. as the level of knowledge and thinking is appropriate for the student. And I think you have several levels, which that's is right. uh, which corresponds with what most programs do, and that is present the more basic knowledge early and then use it and then build on that going right. through the program for sure. Uh, but I do believe I, I'm a big fan of cases. And in fact, uh, for those people who are starting to play around with writing the new NGN items, they're taking for unfolding cases that are sort of open-ended questions and then they're converting them to NGN, which is really fun. We did that a little bit today in one of my webinars. And so um, that, that was fun. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and you can use the NGN type items. You know, there's now 15 of them. Um, you can use those instead of open-ended questions, but you can e use either. My thing about cases, though, if you purchase cases, not yours, but other places, or you're looking in books that publishers do or other websites, sometimes the case is great, but the questions that ask about what's happening in the case are very low level. I hate it when I read a case about COPD and the first question is, what is COPD? I don't need the case to answer that question. That's and right. every question should require information or the context of the case. And the same is true for the new generation uh, in class. And the same is true, even more importantly, for professional practice, right? We don't know what's going to be happening down the pipe. So you don't get open-ended questions. You, you get what you get. So you have to be prepared. Right. Yep. And if you notice, even with the cases that I've written, they have a consistent structure of the same questions that really kind of integrate Tanner's model of clinical judgments and some additional reasoning questions so that they get that consistent practice and that framework is there. So it's very helpful. And so, you know, in closing, Donna, you know, I would just like to get a sense as far as just what are the pearls? You know, we've talked to, we've, we've given a lot of information here in this, uh, in this session this evening, but if you were to just kind of distill maybe all the things that you've learned as an educator and just maybe one or two or three pearls, is that possible? Uh, I would just let you know, if you could prioritize and say, you know, if you had just a few minutes to speak to an educator, what is it that you would really you know, as we look at the, the, the struggles that we're having in nursing education, but also how we can be part of the solution to really strengthen nursing education, because every one of us can be that needed change wherever it's needed. And so from your perspective, how would you, what would be your encouragement 
to educators maybe would be a better question in, in the midst of the things that we're facing right now in so many levels. Um, and what would that look like? I think that educators who often come directly from practice with very little formal education in education, and goodness knows we need recent clinicians, we need people to be relevant with what's happening, um, and, and mix with those who are seasoned educators who maybe aren't as in tune to clinical practice. But I think we need all of everybody. But I think somehow when clinicians come into practice, they take the book and they let that guide them instead of, wait a minute, I'm a clinician. I've worked for 20 years in, in you know, orthopedics or cardiovascular, whatever it might be. Why am I not using, and I had this conversation today at the webinar. One young lady said, I've been teaching for, well, she's not that young, but she'd been teaching for a year, but had been a clinician for 25 years. And she said, I kind of have forgotten what I did clinically. And I just am relying on the book. And she said, you made me realize that I know what's important. I, I did it every day. I knew that I had to look for X, Y, and Z, and I need to be helping my students say, when I took care of patients, this is what I did. Students love stories. They love stories. They love your stories, particularly if they're relevant and recent. Yeah, that's right. So I think we need to rely on a lot on our own experience and use the book as a reference, right? And that that's would be number one. Number two would be spend my time not lecturing, not lecturing. And I'm okay with many lecture bursts, you know, five to 10 minutes, because sometimes you just have to clarify or debrief or summarize. But I think we should be helping the students think in every learning setting. And I want them to think about the questions I ask them. Prioritization. They don't know how to do that. And, and you may not agree with me, some people in the audience, but I don't think Maslow helps you prioritize, not in today's world. 1960s, yeah, that was fine. He's a 1960 dude. I'm sure he was a nice guy, Abraham, but he's not going to function and help us right now today. ABC certainly is relevant. Right? So there are some other models that have helped us recognize the, the, the current and the dynamic and complex nature of healthcare. So we have to keep that in mind. The other thing we have to do is not teach everything we know. What is needed to know to keep your patients safe? And then answer students' questions and verify and validate and clarify that they have the right information and they know when to use the information at the right time. All of this requires thinking. So I used to say, and I still say it today, there are four roles of a nursing educator. Summarize, highlight, clarify, and update. And if you do those things, your students are going to be good thinkers. And modeling that thinking, somebody just wrote that, I was just getting ready to say that, you're reading my mind. (laughs) Because sometimes they don't know how we get from point A to D. And we need to walk them through B and C and tell them, verbalize what our thought process is because that's the only way they're going to learn it. Right, right. And you know, I I love it, Donna. And you know, what I would say, you know, cause I'm still a relatively, you know, a new educator in many ways, but in essence, you know, my lens of practice, I encourage every educator to really never lose that lens of practice that basically nursing needs to be interpreted through. And the textbooks are a guide and, and, and that we just need to, you know, when we look at lecture, I totally agree in, the, in, in all of those principles, Donna, that we need to just bring practice back into a practice-based profession. And so a newer educator is the greatest strength of any program. They may not have the experience, but they have the lens of practice. And so don't lose sight of that ever if you're a newer educator. And so we're going to have some questions here for Donna in closing, and I'm just going to basically give you a minute or two to formulate some thoughts. I'm just going to basically close with some closing comments, and then we'll bring Donna back in just a minute. And I just want to let you know that, you know, we've been talking about decision-making, Tanner, clinical reasoning, clinical judgment. I just want to let you know that I've got a free resource on Keith RN. Uh, It's a COVID-19 skinny reasoning case study, and you can simply just go to my website, keithrn.com. And uh, it's there for you for the grabbing. 
And I've also got other resources on the website as well as on uh, my all-inclusive membership. That's really the best value for educators. Over 110 topics of different levels of complexity of case studies that you can basically level the content of your case study to the level of your student. The skinny reasoning can be suited for your fundamental students as well as the classroom. The unfolding reasoning, which is the most complex, can be used across uh, for your advanced as a synthesis or capstone level. And so just want to let you know that as well as if you're in the membership, I have office hours every Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon tomorrow central time. So be sure to join on a, a video conference link that uh, you've gotten that email in the past and it'll be there for you and I'll be there tomorrow morning. So I want to bring Donna back in and just basically communicate. Uh, Donna, it's been a pleasure having you with us tonight. And I just want to thank you again. And I just want to know what are those questions that are out there? And I know they're in the chat. And so Donna, you've probably been watching the chat as well. And I'm trying to kind of just, uh, there's been a lot of activity here, Donna. So I don't even know where to start, but I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. But uh, Cascading Delirium, I hope that's not his name says, how do we inform educators to change the way they are teaching to be able to answer NGN and CLEX questions? I'll pop it on the screen for you there. Um, great question, Donna. Would your book be a resource? Uh, just um, any thoughts? So I think part of the problem is that uh, they don't want to change. Some educators don't want to change because change is hard for some educators, and I don't know why. So I would tell you that they need to learn best practices because if you were a clinician, you wouldn't do the same old thing you've always done in practice, right? If there's a new policy, a new treatment, a new approach, based on the evidence, you would go to that. We have to change the way we're teaching because we're not gonna get students to get to the point of being able to clinically reason and make clinical judgments. So if they can't do that, they won't be able to answer NGN questions. Dr. Dickinson says, if you teach clinical judgment and you incorporate it in your curriculum, your students, your candidates, your graduates will be able to answer the NGN NCLEX style questions. Meanwhile, if you want to get into having them practice actual questions, you can use my book, Developing Clinical Judgment, and it's for RN. The PN will be coming out uh, in fall, in this fall. Um, it's being produced as we speak. And it gives the opportunities for unfolding cases that are at the appropriate level. And it gives them a chance to see those new NGN or some of them anyway, some of the new item types. So you'll kind of get double benefit from using that. But it is a workbook that has to be adopted across and it's across lifespan. And it's built from basic to more complex so that it is a workbook for students. You, you really shouldn't be, and I had this happen in a couple of schools, they're running off copies and giving it to students. It's a copyrighted, it is a copyrighted product, so we need to have them adopt that. But how great that would be to integrate in your curriculum. Okay, thanks, Donna. Got another question here for you. What nursing education material is out there do you view as an absolute need to read in the nursing curriculum or need to include in the nursing curriculum? So I'm not sure if you're talking about for students or faculty. So could the person who asked that clarify? Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you just basically start with faculty since educators are primarily watching this, Donna, and maybe for students. So you could, why don't you just comment on both sides? Okay, so if you're doing a concept-based curriculum, because that, that's quite different from traditional, um, I did write a book, by the way. Uh, uh, for educators yep. uh, teaching and learning uh, conceptually. And I think that's a, a book that came out by Jones and Bartlett and it's her faculty. And that walks you through the how to. It's how to teach and how to evaluate students in a concept-based curriculum. If you are just looking for general, and that's CBC. If you're looking for general information about curriculum, there are a couple of books out there. One is by Keating, K E A T I N G, and she does a great job of both curriculum and evaluation. So if you're looking for resources, that would be where I'd start. Excellent. And so, other than that, I'm just kind of looking here, Donna, and saying if uh, I, I'm looking at, I've got a lot of comments, um, but I'm just looking to see. Um, 
specifically just any other specific questions that we may have missed Donna did I miss anything or did you see anything in the chat that popped in over the course of our conversation that you'd like to comment on they wanted you to post a link to the workbook but if you don't have that you can check with your Elsevier rep it's, it's uh, been published by Elsevier and you can get a desk copy for review okay and that's titled developing clinical judgment for professional nursing practice. Right, but if you wanna exact, and I love that because that's kind of, you know, Donna, we, we could have another conversation, but the other piece that we really need to also emphasize in nursing education, and then Nelda Godfrey's doing some wonderful work on his professional identity formation and professionalism, but bottom line is, is that yes, so on Amazon, you could kind of get the essence of that title, put it together and uh, get that information. So other than that, uh, Donna, do you have a closing comment or thought? Well, I just appreciate after a long day, I know some of you are on the East Coast, so it's a bit late, uh, but I do appreciate that you've joined me and feel free. I think you're gonna put up my email. If you yes, have- Yes, I'll do that right now. Thank you for the reminder. There we go. Sure. There's the link for uh, the, the book that you can uh, ask your rep for. You can order it, get it uh, digitally or uh, there's also Evolve resources that go with the book, so students can go in and they can study um, and uh, practice questions. I see a question here about traditional linear care plans as far as clinical judgment. Oh, don't get me started on care plans. So nursing process is linear, <laughs> care plans are more linear because you're only on a care plan can deal with one problem at a time. And we know that because there's an interrelatedness of many problems, and even interventions that it's hard to you know, pull out, tease out each one. For example, I might have a patient who's extremely anxious after a fracture, after falling and having a fracture, but also has pain. Well, is that three problems or is that really one? You know, if we could manage the pain, probably the anxiety would be alleviated. If we could uh, make this individual or help this individual feel less vulnerable, that would help the anxiety. So it's so interrelated. That is why I really, really like concept mapping. I know that's not how it's done on actual units, but we know that it's a great learning tool. Graphic organizers are great for your visual learners. I just read an article today uh, in a nursing education journal that says that we're finding more and more of our students are more visual. We have a lot of visual learners. And so something like a concept map really, really helps them. And it avoids that um, linear kind of approach. I'm not talking about concept maps that come prepared, structured with boxes and you put information in them. I'm talking about a freestyle, making the connections. Making connections from a neurobiological standpoint is outstanding for imp improving thinking. Excellent, Donna. Well, listen, I just want to thank you again, Donna, for joining me tonight. And uh, with that, that's the last question. I want to thank you all for attending tonight's uh, live stream. And in the next two weeks, I'll be here live and I'll be presenting some strategies on how to basically keep it practical with unfolding case studies in your program and how to practice the most important skill your students need to develop, which is clinical judgment. So thank you again for attending and we'll see you next time. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. Good night.